Hi, it's Tom here from FDS, and today we are going to look at this and how it can be used in Nerf. And these are MOSFETs. Now, the UK community has been using these for quite some time. If you look back on my history, you can see there's a very old uh, demolisher video that uses a MOSFET, and I thought I'd get this one in before uh, the Make Test Battle do theirs, just to steal all their views. Now, MOSFETs. What are they? How do they work? How can you use them? Right, main thing to remember is don't worry about why it works or how it works, just know that it does. If you try, start trying to understand them and you're new to electronic components, um, you're just going to fry your head. Think of it as a chemical relay, it's based on transistor technology, that's all you need to know. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the parts list. So starting with the MOSFET, you want an irfz 44 N series MOSFET. They come in a variety of amperages. Pick an amperage that's got plenty of headroom to your motor combination. Uh, I'd say you want at least 60. They do get hot when you get near the top end and obviously if the heat increases the resistance increases through the uh, thing and its current capacity carrying capacity drops. So those are not absolutes. Just remember that those are at room temperature not when they're overheated. Uh, the next thing you need is a 10,000 ohm resistor. The last thing that you need is this, which is an IN5400 rectifier diode. Here is the circuit diagram I'll be using. The other things you'll need is you'll need some signal wire, which is, this is just thin wire. You can recycle all of this out of blasters if you want, and um, you'll need some of that. And then you'll need, ideally, if you're doing higher current stuff, you'll need some 16 AWG silicon multi-strand hobby wire um, for the main harness. And the advantage about this method is it doesn't use as much of this thick wire, it uses lots of thin wire. And the, the loom we're going to be looking at today is going in a modulus where there's not much space. It's also very useful in the gin so and in the Cassian Andor. So first stage is to take your 10K resistor and your MOSFET. So your 10K resistor starts out looking like that. You might want to mess with the legs and uh, your MOSFET. Now the MOSFET has three pins and those are the source, the drain and the gate. And that is with the silver tag, which is the heat sink, um, facing down. So what you want to do is you want to solder the 10K resistor. I like putting it up and over the top. It's easier than putting it in the wires, feeding these. Um, just run that between your source and your gate. So just over the top like that in an airsoft style is a good way of doing it. It takes up less space. So that's your first job. So you've done that. This is all the stuff we're going to come to later. Now you'll see this has got a battery box with a plug on the end. Now you may be saying, why are you going to do that? Um, this is for a child's blaster. And what I've done is I've made it future proof so that um, if the uh, young person gets more involved in modding, um, they can change components as they go. So it will currently run off virtually any battery uh, and can be upgraded to suit. That is the big advantage of MOSFET. It's one of the reasons why I like using it. Not only is it safer because it puts all your high current switching out of the grip trigger, um, but it also allows you to make one loom to rule them all. So this loom will carry anything from stock motors and a set of AA alkalines right the way up to 3S LiPo and a pair of Hellcats with a high crush flywheels. So the first piece of wiring to set up is your rev trigger. This is a stock one. Obviously, you can use any trigger you like. And uh, here I've got my piece of control wiring, which is, again, nice and thin, goes through the shell easily. I'm just going to tin the ends of the wire. Right, always put heat shrink on every connection. Now, we're using the usual Britneuf standard wiring um, colours, and that means red is uh, permanent lives, so that's anything that's positive, permanent live, and blue is feeds from switches. So in this case, you've got three pins on the Nerf micro switch, and uh, obviously I'll endeavour to show you these. So if your switch is either way up, it's easy to tell which is which. What you've got, the middle one is always the common pin, and that's where your power goes in. Then you have two positions. You have normally open, which means when the switch is out, that pin doesn't have anything coming out of it, and that the switch is open, it's open position, and normally closed, which means when this is in its rest position, that one is shut. And we're going to want to put the red wire to the center pin, which is the common, and the blue wire to the normally closed, so that when we push the rev trigger in, like that, it makes the connection and sends a signal current to the MOSFET, um, which will then activate the MOSFET from the switch. So we're going to start by putting those two on. 
And again, a little holdy hand is always useful, so if you're burning your fingers. The other advantage about this is using a nice thin cable, so you're not putting so much heat into the micro switches, and people cook these all the time. I've seen so many people go, no, my switch feels really squishy. And it's because they've put too much temperature into the switch by trying to solder a massive fat wire to a little tiny pin. Always heat shrink the joint, don't want to leave that. Uninsulated, just good practice. So it's your first join, and you can then join your first connection to your MOSFET, which is fairly simple. So again, you've got to strip your wires. Remember your color scheme. So blue, this is the feed, which is coming from the micro switches, uh, normally open, open position. So if you've got one of those big on-ons that everybody seems to think are amazing, um, or the little micro cherry DC2s, um, and then you can still use those if you want a clunkier rev trigger. And um, you've just got to remember the poles. So, uh, so that's ready. And you can now make the first connection to your bed. So blue wire to the gate. You can cut those pins down if you want. If you short space. So again, nice quick first of soldering. And that's on there now. Okay, now we can make the second connection from this wire. And the red wire, uh, which again, remember, is going to your micro switch down here. Um, that is going to be your power feed from your main loom. So that's going straight back to the battery. You can see there's the battery connection. And that just goes to the main battery lead, which is the main positive lead. Don't worry about the other stuff on this lead. I'll go through all of that as we go. I did some of it beforehand. Um, all those of you who love Blue Peter, here's some that I made earlier and I prepared a little bit because you don't need to see me solder all the connections. I'm about four hours in on this job as it is. Again, sleeve that. So that's the switch now fully wired and you can see that that's going to that third pin on the um, MOSFET and then the other one is going from the battery power. And uh, that's that part of the loom done. So now we go on to the next connections which you're gonna make to the MOSFET. And um, what you've got is you've got um, two connections in the negative to do next and then we'll also look at where this goes which is your diode now this one's for Alice coke duck this is a flyback diode and the purpose of the flyback diode is to stop back EMF from the motors remember when you let go of a motor it turns goes or it turns backwards it becomes a generator it stops back EMF from going in here and interfering with the circuits in the FET, uh, with the chemical reaction circuit inside the FET. So you don't want back EMF, and all this does is it stops the uh, current, it just sends it round, so out of the way and protects the FET. So flyback diode is a necessity, you must have that part, you can't skip it. Now we're gonna connect the next pin on the MOSFET, which is the center pin, which is the drain, and the um, wire that comes from the drain is the one that goes out, and it goes along here and into the motor block. So you can see I've got a plug-in motor block here because I like using those. It's much easier, it makes the loom modular. You can remove the motors for servicing and if you want to change them or you want to change the flywheel cage, you've got a plug in there. It saves a lot of time. You just have to open the shell, take out four screws, pull the uh, flywheel cage. So you can ignore this plug and just imagine a continuous length of wire if you want to wire it the old fashioned way. So what I've got to do now is put that one onto the center pin. So that's the gate going out here and through to the motor's negative line. And you can see that I um, got down to the diode in that line as well, and I put it between these two, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So I'm just going to make the connection to the center pin on the gate here, and I've raised the leg up just to give myself a little bit more access. It just makes life a little bit easier, and then you won't solder it to two of the uh, pins by mistake, which is easily done if you have the legs down. So there's a narrow gap between them. And again, nice bit of heat shrink to go over the end. So 
So that leaves us with our third and final connection to the actual FET itself. And the third and final connection is the one that comes from the main battery lead, and uh, in this case the battery tray, and that is just the main battery negative lead. So nothing fancy, battery negative is going on the remaining pin on the FET. And this is an end channel FET, which means it's working on the negative feed. So there you go, there's those, and I'll just do that last connection. Okay, so that's the FET completed. And what we need to do is we just need to look quickly and review the connections. So we're going FET facing, heat sink facing down, FET facing up. There's your 10K resistor over the top, which is going from the ground to the source. And then from left to right, we've got on the ground pin, um, that is your um, signal wire from your switch. And then on the drain pin, we've got the um, negative motor wire. And on the source pin, we've got the negative from the battery or power supply. And if you were doing this for a master arming switch, um, you would have the, this would be your main battery lead going on off to the rest of the blaster. Um, and this would be your main battery lead coming in from the battery pack. And this would be your um, signal wire from one end of your arming switch. And then the other end of your arming switch would just be a feed from your battery positive, just like we've got here. So if you imagine that going, and this being a big on-off switch that just turned off the whole blaster, that's how you do that. So there's a, another use for those MOSFETs there. They're very handy for that. You can use nice, neat, rather cool looking switches instead of a big, clunky, heavy duty one. So the last thing you need to do is to secure your flyback diode, and that needs to go um, in the feed to the motors, because it's the motors that generate the back EMF, you can put them between the motor poles. Um, there's nothing to stop you putting them up here between here. Um, some people do it like that because it keeps it out of the way. I put it here between the plug, before the plug, because then I don't have to do it for every single motor. I only have to use it on the wiring loom. So the key thing with the diode is to get it round the right way. Now, uh, the IN5400 has just got a silver band on the end. Um, don't worry about anode and cathode. Just put the silver band by the red positive lead and the non-silver band to the black negative lead. And that will get your cath your that will get your diode round the right way to prevent the back EMF from damaging the FET. And now we're ready to test, and I'm going to go over how to test your MOSFET, and you can see the switch and the circuit in it. So things to look out for, FET temperature. Um, if your FET gets very hot, the minute you plug stuff in, you've got a mistake. Usually it's your diode is round backwards. Um, or you've got a connection wrong somewhere. So just be aware, FET temperature, they do get hot under heavy load, but if you've made a mistake and you're bypassing it, this is one of the reasons why you shouldn't use um, a LiPo for testing, because a LiPo will cook a FET in no time whatsoever. It'll melt the internals, um, destroying its chemical nature. So when you test, keep your hand near the FET just to feel the temperature. Don't stick it on there, because if you've got a mistake, it'll get red hot very quickly. If it does get red hot, immediately pull the power and you'll be fine. Um, if you have been stupid and used a LiPo for this testing and it suddenly gets hot, um, then just pull the LiPo plug and be aware that uh, at some point you want to check the balance on those cells and just check the cell voltage. So you can see that's working really well. I know my flywheels around the right way because I haven't touched the motors or removed them. And uh, that is now nice and responsive. These react far, far quicker than a mechanical relay because they're chemical. So you've got no lag time in terms of switching within these because they're chemical. So just bear that in mind that it's not like you have to wait a nanosecond for a relay to flick across. So now we're finished. I just thought I'd show you how it all fits into the modulus. So if we start in the grip area here, you can see that there's loads of room. With that nice thin signal wire, you can work it back into the standard wire run and get it right out the way of the trigger mechanism down in here. So there's no need then to have a huge great big fat wire getting in the way of all your trigger mechanism here and that still leaves space up here for potential other bits and pieces and uh, I've added some wiring here for some LEDs and then at the front you can see that I make use of all this dead space down here and the MOSFET is sitting in some nice open space there just in case it does heat up a little bit and uh, you can see all the plugs all fit down nicely out the way and the shell half will hold that in place and will hold all of those in place and there's also this dead space under here you can move this motor plug up under here there's room in, in here for the motor plug 
Um, but there's lots of space in there then if you want to put in additional LEDs and other things, um, you do have lots of room. I know a couple of Brit nerfers have worked on some extremely elaborate um, LED setups for this blaster. So there is a bit more space then and I like this as a spot to put that in. So there you go, that is how you use your MOSFETs and how to get them inside the modulus just so that you can see the finished product.